wonderful to be with all of you at St. Mary's and Stewart. I was very happy to be among the vestry in this similar electronic mode yesterday. And that was a great session. And later today, we're going to be doing a leadership workshop at 2.30. And that will be for all of the leaders of the Diocese of uh, Southeast Florida. So it's wonderful to be with you electronically. I truly regret that I cannot be with you in person because I love the sunshine. So I regret that. But I do wish to thank uh, your, your rector, Father Todd, as well as uh, Tim Cotter, who put everything together, and uh, Tom Winter, also, who is in the midst of trying to pull our last bits of technology together. I know how difficult that is. It's usually just me on my own doing all of this myself. So <clears throat> sincerely appreciate you guys hosting me. Let me just, there we go. Okay. And you should see now the Episcopal Church Foundation and only one slide up. You don't see two. Bob, if you could not. Yes. Excellent. And this is also helpful to have somebody else on the line seeing it. So great. So uh, just to get started, um, the Episcopal Church Foundation uh, is the organization that I work for. It is the foundation for the entire Episcopal Church. So we serve all parishes, dioceses, and related Episcopal entities like the wonderful Episcopal Relief and Development and, and many others. And we seek to empower their leaders and those of congregations throughout the country <clears throat> in a variety of ways in empowering you to do what God has called you to do in your own particular way. We do that in a number of different ways, primarily through leadership and financial resource programs. Many of you who uh, may be leaders at the congregation are familiar with ECF Vital Practices, uh, ecfvp.org, as well as our other publications to help leaders in congregations such as the Vestry Resource Guide, or the Finance uh, Resource Guide. In addition to that, there are numerous educational events we do to help and empower uh, leaders throughout the church. In addition, we have a number of financial resource areas. We have a new website that I oversee called ecf360.org, which is a comprehensive website for leaders and congregations. Uh, to put together their annual capital and planned giving efforts. ECF is the main planned giving resource for the Episcopal Church. It's part of why I'm doing these events today. We also have a wonderful donor advised fund, if that's something, and I'll mention that again a bit later, as well as an endowment management program where we can help congregations and other Episcopal entities like dioceses manage their assets. Excuse the cough. Um, so just FYI to everybody uh, who is listening to this in the future, not on November the 7th, this is a recorded webinar and I am hopeful that uh, it will be helpful to you. Our purpose today is to focus in on different types of gifts, primarily, primarily planned gifts. Um, however, let me explain a bit and uh, then we can uh, get into greater detail and hopefully locally I can also hear some questions or it'll all be up to Bob and Brent to come up with every question today. So Bob and Brent give that some thought. Anyway, okay. So to start with the basics. Oh, I see the pen. Uh-oh. And he's on the finance committee. All right. So um, to start with ordinary, there are three basic types of gifts that people can make when they make them to a charity, to their parish. The first being ordinary giving. This is most often, this is commonly seen in the annual stewardship effort where uh, someone makes a commitment and uh, during the fall campaign, I know you guys do yours in early January, but you make a commitment for the oncoming year. People <clears throat> make those gifts typically out of the income which they receive, their regular income. The second type of giving is extraordinary giving, which is most often seen within the context of a capital campaign where you lay out a plan for either doing um, physical uh, changes to the church or you're raising endowment funds or whatever the case might be, but you lay out those plans in a clear, comprehensive manner, usually with the help 
of outside professionals and you seek to get commitments from people on a three to five year basis and people pay those off. It's a very, very important uh, gift that people make. And most people will make those gifts out of assets they hold or out of extra income they may have. Third type of giving, which we're gonna focus in on today is ultimate giving or planned giving or legacy giving. It all goes uh, under this same category. And these are gifts which people normally make out of their estate or out of assets that they're holding for retirement. And I draw your attention to one word in this description and that is the word future. And I talked a lot about this to your vestry yesterday. Planned gifts are future focused gifts. And I know that all of you today that are considering making a planned gift desire it to last for the future mission and ministry of St. Mary's. It's a crucially important gift to you as a person. And um, it's very important that the leadership of the parish works appropriately in, in this manner. Okay, so next, I just want to focus a little bit on the different types of uh, gifts that can be made just very briefly because we are dealing in a world where a lot of current gifts sort of carry over into the planned giving world. And there are opportunities in both ways uh, for all of these different types of gifts, obviously cash, appreciated assets like stocks or uh, ETFs or other things like that. Um, and the reason I bring this up as well is because I'm talking with folks in Florida and in Florida, there are quite a few retirees who consider making major gifts and in, in the present and they consider those planned gifts because they are a part of their overall strategic plan for the gifts that they make out of their estate in total throughout their lives. And so uh, just to note a few important aspects of different types of gifts, donor advised funds. This is one that is continuing to grow in popularity. I'll show you a few slides in a moment about that. Private foundations. In many ways, these private family foundations can be an extension of the giving of the individual or of their family where people make significant gifts to their private foundation and then make grants from that uh, long into the future. In addition, there are IRA and other gifts uh, that can be made from one's estate. Now with the IRA, I'm gonna talk about that next there are some special aspects when it comes to giving through an IRA. And again, I'm talking about a traditional IRA, not about all of the other types, uh, such as a 401k or a 403b. So um, what has been happening for quite some time is that a lot of people who are over 70 and a half are making gifts directly to charities like your congregation through what is known as a qualified charitable distribution. Now, what that is, is that instead of paying the tax like someone would normally when they take money out of an IRA, if they give it directly to charity through this qualified charitable distribution or QCD, they do not pay taxes on that under the current laws up to $100,000. And that can be made directly to your parish. Now, uh, it used to be the same age, a change in the law made it a little different. What's known as a required minimum distribution must be made from all of the different types of deferred uh, tax retirement accounts, such as 401ks and 403bs and IRAs. But in the case of IRAs, IRAs enable you to make this special qualified charitable distribution. The other two do not. And once you've passed the 72 mark and you are assigned a required minimum distribution, you can actually have your qualified charitable distribution count for uh, that required minimum distribution up to $100,000. I note this because a lot of the older baby boomers and others um, may not have made their IRA the main focus of their retirement. And this may, may be a burden to some people having to take uh, that required minimum distribution and to have to pay taxes on that. And so they can consider making a gift to the parish or to another charity 
so that they don't pay extra taxes and they stay underneath a variety of thresholds that are beneficial to them. I'll come back to some other aspects of this, but um, on to the donor advised fund very, very briefly. I believe most of the folks in this congregation are aware of what a donor advised fund is. It's a great philanthropic tool gaining in popularity giving millions and millions of dollars away through grants. The basic way that these work is that a donor makes typically a significant contribution to their DAF, and then they give grants out of that donor advised fund to one or more charities over the course of many years. Now, why this has become so popular nowadays is because a few years ago when the tax laws changed, a lot of people stopped being able to uh, take deductions, itemized deductions on their taxes. And so for some people who perhaps had a, a, a good year and they wanted to reduce their taxable income, they might choose particular years where they consolidate or bulk their gifts all in one and either create or add to a donor advised fund. And that way they can get the full tax deduction in the year uh, that they need it and then make grants that they advise the sponsoring charity to make. Now the Episcopal Church Foundation, I'll mention this later, does have a donor advised fund. We have a very low threshold, much lower than uh, a variety of others like the wonderful Fidelity or Charles Schwab or others like that. You can set up a donor advised fund with ECF for as little as $2,500. But many people create much bigger uh, donor advised funds to get the advantage of uh, the tax deduction in those particular years that they need it. Real quick, there are obviously a few don'ts and happy to share these slides with Tim and Tom for further uh, distribution to everybody. But the bottom line with a donor advised fund, because it was a completed gift, when the gift was made, you cannot, um, as the donor, pay off an obligatory pledge like you've made to a capital campaign where you signed an absolute contract with someone to make a pledge or that you get, um, tickets. I don't think people are going to be looking for Michigan State tickets as much anymore because they lost yesterday. But hey, that's what everybody back home is telling me. I don't really follow football. But you can't get uh, something in exchange for your gift, uh, such as football tickets or some other benefit. So just as an FYI, but these continue to grow in importance and can be very valuable. And my next slide is all going to be about planned gifts, but I did want to start with both of those because in both cases, an IRA as well as a donor advised fund, they often will have remainder values. And I'll mention this again in a moment, but those remainder values can be given directly to charity. And so in many ways, uh, uh, donor advised funds and IRAs, I often call, as well as the other types of tax deferred uh, accounts, I call planned giving adjacent because they are so close and often do interact with uh, one's planned giving efforts. And I'd love to get some questions, especially from the folks there in person at St. Mary's, if that's possible. I'll have another uh, pause for questions in a moment. But before I get deeply into uh, planned giving. Any questions so far? I, I, have a question. I have a question. Go ahead, Brent. Uh, yes, you, you said earlier in your presentation that this worked with traditional IRAs. Does that include Roth IRAs? No, it does not. I'm sorry. You can check with your own financial advisor. And again, I am not giving legal tax or financial advice in any way, shape, or form. I am simply raising awareness of options for you to consider. And you should check with your own financial advisor just to see what's possible for you in your context, the assets you hold, the types of accounts, but no, not for Roth. Be nice, but not. It's, you know, that's after tax income. It's, it's this, you, you could probably, you know, take a withdrawal and, and then make a gift, but that's a little different. So, oh, Trina. Who has a question? Trina does. Trina, what's your question? Jim, Jim is there. Hi, Jim. Trina Perna. Hi, Trina. What's your question? 
I am wondering, so when I put together my, my will and estate plans. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk all about that in a minute. Go ahead. Um, then, then I had St. Mary's in some of the ones that were, had, like you're saying, traditional IRAs or 401ks. And I was told that that meant something would happen to all the other donors on the list. And I should give to St. Mary's something separate from that. And what I'm asking is, can I start giving to, I'm still alive and I hope to still be living for a while, but can I, so. can I give to it now? Like you're doing, you're talking about the DA. F, the donor proof funds, can we give to it and then we can start just keep giving our legacy in advance so I don't cause a problem when I die and they can have the money now? So <clears throat> this may, I'm afraid this may, this sounds like it might be a little more complex that we may want to deal with altogether. However, do you have a traditional IRA right now? Hello? She, she does. And are you over 70 and a half? No, she's 31. Okay. God bless you. All right. No, you must be 70 and a half to make a gift like a qualified charitable distribution out of your traditional IRA in the present. What you can do <clears throat> for the future is you could make St. Mary's or other charities, the ultimate beneficiary of the IRA or other uh, tax deferred retirement accounts. And I'll say this again in a second, but when you do that, when you pass at a very significant age from now, uh, the assets would then be given to St. Mary's completely tax free without paying any of the deferred taxes. Okay. So, but as long as I'm here on earth, can I start giving to my own death fund now in increments? You can't and take, you can't take withdrawals from your IRA um, until you're 70 and a half without paying uh, significant taxes and under 55, you, there will be other um, uh, penalties you would have to pay too. So to make a gift to the congregation, uh, when you're younger is usually best with uh, making a cash gift, making gifts of appreciated securities you may hold. You can create without use, again, to be clear, without using the assets that are in a tax deferred account, you cannot use those for a donor advised fund, but you could create using cash, appreciated securities and other gifts uh, you can create a donor advised fund in those years that it would be beneficial for you to get a tax deduction and then make grants out of that donor advised fund uh, to a variety of charities. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. And I'm happy to chat with you uh, separately. So um, let's, unless there's another specific question, we can dive right into plan giving. And I have another time uh, very soon where we'll stop again for questions. Is that good? Okay, so um, planned gifts. Uh, I've already explained what they are. These are gifts out of one's estate or out of assets you're holding for retirement. And you're seeing a basic summary of that on the screen right now. And the two most important words in that description are the words personal values. Everything uh, when it comes to planned giving comes down to this emotive response that you feel so deeply about the future mission and ministry of your congregation or another charity that you wish to raise them to the level of family in, in your estate plans. This is the central understanding when it comes to planned giving that you wish to put your parish or other charities at the same place that your children or grandchildren would be. So this is the most important aspect and one which I invite all of you to reflect on today and reflect on what types of gifts, just like we just had this discussion, at different stages of your life, different gifts will be more appropriate than others. And there may be opportunities that I'll be talking about that will help you to decide which gift is right for you. So um, all of you should have a copy of what I gave uh, to Tom and Tim, which is what I call the cheat sheet. 
And that is a recap of all the different types of planned gifts. And as I say, I met with your uh, vestry leadership yesterday. And so I will be helping them uh, throughout this process. But your parish already has a wonderful program going on, wonderful opportunities to participate. So uh, please do consider that. So if I were there in person, I'm a bit of a jokester. I like to joke around a bit as Bob already knows, but um, just to note, there is a section of our Book of Common Prayer where there is the clearest direction uh, for clergy to take these actions, to encourage people to make a planned gift. If I were there in person, I could joke around a bit with your priest or who, uh, the rest of the clergy that were there and test if they actually know where this is in the Book of Common Prayer. I don't have that advantage today. So I will just tell you, uh, this is in the section for the birth or celebration of a child. So a very, very appropriate place where some, where clergy should be encouraging you to reflect on what has been most important to you in your lifetime. What have been the institutions that you feel connected to like family that you would wish to remember in your will? But this is also, if you think about it, exactly the right time to be encouraging people when they have children, when they're becoming parents to make these important decisions albeit that will change and adapt throughout their lifetime. And we encourage everyone to seek appropriate legal tax and financial assistance to ensure that their wishes will be fulfilled in time. I will make one uh, last little joke though. What's interesting about um, this section is it's actually in, it's in our Book of Common Prayer going all the way back to 1549. And I recently had to reconfirm this by looking at the actual text. Um, but it was in sort of an odd place originally. I think it's very appropriate where it is now in uh, the celebration, birth or adoption of a child. It used to be in the ministration of the sick. So you can imagine, perhaps it would be somewhat of an awkward situation for your priest to go visit someone and say, oh my goodness, Jane, you don't look so well today, but have you considered making a planned gift to the congregation? Okay, I, I'm hoping there's laughter there somewhere in St. Mary's. I know Brent's laughing, so that's, that's uh, the important thing. Okay, so I just want to briefly go through a variety of planned gifts. As I say, all of you should have a cheat sheet, which will help in this. We're only going to touch, only going to touch a little bit on each of them. And this is not, just to be clear, this is not to turn any of you into planned giving experts. It's simply to raise your awareness so that you have a basic understanding of all the different types and to go home and consider, well, what is best for you and your family, both now, possibly in the future? Okay. Bequests. Now, bequests, I'm considering a very broad category. Generally, when folks talk about a bequest, they are talking about a probated will. In reality, fewer and fewer assets are ending up in probated wills nowadays. That is because people are creating inter vivos trusts that hold assets during your lifetime and then become distributive trusts uh, when you pass away and are kept out of the public view. In addition, there are many, many uh, accounts where there is a transfer on death option, even on the original application. So some stock accounts, basically all uh, retirement accounts like 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, et cetera, all of these different types are going to be transferred outside of the probated estate. However, let me just... Um, make a pitch that everyone, everyone really should consider and seek appropriate legal help in creating a valid will. You want to ensure that your wishes are fulfilled, so I strongly urge you to work with appropriate legal and financial professionals to ensure that your wishes are fulfilled, that uh, assets that you have are given to the individuals and charities that you wish. Sadly, Statistically, around the country, it's about 
50% of Americans do not have a written will. And it's important uh, as a part of my plan giving ministry and those of the leaders of your congregation to encourage this. So I, I encourage you to do that. However, when it comes to all of these different ways of distributing one's estate, they fall into this category of bequests. And there are different types of bequests. The first type is a specific amount. I give $10,000 to St. Mary's in Stewart, Florida. That's a great gift to make. The challenge sometimes when you have multiple specific dollar amounts allocated, those all must be paid first before any other allocations are made in your estate or the residuum can be paid out. And unfortunately, you don't really know uh, how big of an estate or how small of an estate you might have when you pass. Many people encounter tremendous expenses late in life for health care, nursing home care, etc. And sometimes uh, you can deplete your estate by having to pay out those specific uh, bequests first. So that's just something to consider. I'm not telling you that's what you need to do, but that is something to consider. Another option which might work better and is usually required when uh, doing other distributions like uh, pay on death for an account would be a percentage. So you would give a certain percentage to each of your children, 10%, like a tithe or something, to the congregation, etc. Very useful manner to do bequests. And it enables you to still demonstrate that sense of devotion to the charity um, by the amount of the percentage. You can also give specific assets to individuals or to charity. Now, if you're considering leaving perhaps a valuable asset like jewelry or a Rembrandt or something, you know, uh, a Miro that's hanging in your bathroom, whatever the case might be. Um, if you're considering giving that to charity, I'd strongly urge you to reach out to the charity and talk to leadership about whether or not they can even accept the gift. Also, if you're giving a specific item that isn't cash or appreciated securities and is not specifically related to the mission of the charity, your deduction uh, is gonna be uh, less. That's also when you're living, but anyway. So reach out to leadership if you're thinking of giving a specific asset like real estate, especially because perhaps uh, the charity can or cannot accept that piece of real estate. Remainder is what it sounds like. So after making other allocations in your estate, whatever remains is given to charity or to one or more of your children, however you wish that to be. Now that can be often the largest gift that's left to charity when someone leaves a remainder, intentionally and unintentionally. Intentionally, if you really wanted the majority of your estate to go to charity, but it could be unintentional if you did not plan out the assets that you anticipate being in your estate for distribution and you could actually end up leaving too much uh, in your remainder. So that is why working with a professional advisor can certainly help you to, do, to ensure that your wishes are fulfilled. The last bequest type I'll mention is a contingent bequest. That is where if this happens, such as if your spouse were pre, would, would predecease you or God forbid one of your children were to predecease you, then whatever allocation you had made would go to someone else, another person or to a charity or whatever uh, you desire. So it's in case of, and again, that's good planning and a good attorney should help you to think through what are the potential and most likely contingencies to consider. Request designations. Uh, when I'm talking to leaders, I often uh, joke and, and ask every vestry person to raise their hand if they would rather have a restricted or an unrestricted bequest. And surprise, surprise, the vestry would much rather uh, get an unrestricted bequest that they can uh, choose how to use it, whether or not to put it in the endowment or whatever the, their uh, endowment and gift acceptance policies would instruct them. So again, if you 
are desiring to restrict your gift in some way. If you have a great love of music or um, service to the community and you wanted to restrict your gift to a specific purpose, please seek out uh, the leadership of the parish and speak with them about it because it may or may not work well for them. And what you're trying to avoid are what are known as anachronistic restrictions over time, or just tying the hands of a future vestry with a gift that they cannot adequately use. Um, back in my home state of Michigan, there was a wonderful industrialist who <laughs> created an endowment for coal, the, the mineral to be given to the poor at Christmas time. That's a great idea in the 19th century, not so great of an idea in the 21st. So those are the kinds of things you just need to be aware of when you're desiring to restrict. Reach out, talk to the leaders, ensure that it's an appropriate restriction because there may be a balance that can be struck. Also, uh, there is a threshold amount for creating a restricted fund at your parish. So you may wish to investigate that as well. Okay, so now for everyone, just take a very brief, deep, but deep breath. We're going to talk a little bit about the more complex gifts, and we're not going to spend too much time on life income gifts. These are gifts that are extremely appealing to people in their retirement years. And um, the way they work is that the donor would make a current gift, but it is irrevocable. They cannot get that gift back because it's an irrevocable gift. They receive a significant charitable deduction in the year they make the gift. And in exchange for that gift, the donor or whomever the donor designates, right? The donor or whomever the donor designates will receive income typically for the rest of their life. When the person receiving income passes away, that is when the assets that are in that gift are liquidated and paid out to the various Episcopal charities that were originally designated by the donor, all right? So that is how these gifts work. They are more complex. They are not for everyone, but quite honestly, um, I like to bring them up for two reasons. One, because so many people in their retirement years can benefit by them. And two, because the Episcopal Church Foundation is the main resource for planned giving in the Episcopal Church, um, we take care of all of these gifts. So we have programs in place for these three gift types that I will mention. And all you need to do if you're an interested donor is simply reach out to us or one of my staff at the Episcopal Church Foundation, and we can help you uh, figure out which gift is best for you because they are a little different. Okay, and ECF takes care of all of the back office work. We work with a very significant investment advisor, State Street Global Advisors up in Boston uh, to take care of all of these things. But basically we take care of all the heavy lifting so that dioceses and parishes don't have to, but you as an individual are welcome to consider them. Very, very briefly, and if folks fall asleep, at this point, that's okay. Just make sure you have your cheat sheet, keep it by your bedside at night and recite this back to yourself to help you fall asleep because subliminally you'll be educated about the different types of plant gifts. Okay, the first is called a pooled income fund. This is a gift that's not as popular, honestly, anymore, but the Episcopal Church Foundation still has it as an option. The way it works is after you make your uh, original gift, you receive the yield of that gift, the interest and the dividends, right? So it's not digging into the principle of this gift. So if you're someone who doesn't need consistent income and isn't as concerned about income, but wants to leave the maximum remainder, this might be the gift you wish to make because you'll receive a flow of income for the rest of your life. It will vary from year to year, whatever the assets produce, but uh, because you're not digging into the principle, this will typically give the original gift that you had given uh, to the charity. The most popular, the most popular uh, life income gift, which I'll give you an example of in a moment, is called the charitable gift annuity. And if any of you uh, went to college and you're of the right age, you've probably already been approached 
about a charitable gift annuity. These are extremely popular. These work a little differently. This is where, based upon your age or the age of the person who will be ultimately receiving the gift, whether it's a, you know, a couple or one person, based upon the age of the people receiving the income, there is a specific annuity rate that's assigned to your age, okay? So that you will get a fixed amount of income guaranteed by uh, the Episcopal Church Foundation for the rest of your life. So when you make this gift, you actually enter into an annuity contract with the sponsoring charity, in this case, the, the Episcopal Church Foundation, and you will originally be paid out um, from the gift for that fixed amount of income, and that income, which I'll display to you in a second, is uh, the annuity rate based upon your ages multiplied by your original gift, and that's the fixed amount you'll receive for the rest of your life. So that's very appealing to a number of people in their retirement years so that they can have this. What this leaves for charity, statistically, on average, it's about 50%, about half of the original gift will be left for charity. And that is because the annuity rates are much higher and are set up so that they dig very slowly into the principle of the gift. However, just so that you know, um, it is possible if the gift is um, reduced down to zero, the charity won't receive any gift, but the people receiving income because they had an annuity contract with the Episcopal Church Foundation would continue to receive income uh, for the rest of their life as specified, okay? So I'll be giving an example of that because that's the most popular. Very briefly, there is another type, which is a bit more complex, usually used for more complex assets, and when individuals need more flexibility on creating it, and that is called a charitable remainder trust. Um, these trusts are actually very flexible for the individual creating them. But what I wanted to share with you, which is a real advantage, is that the Episcopal Church Foundation can meet with the donor and the donor's attorney in advance of creating this gift. And ECF's attorney would draft up the initial trust documents for you and your attorney to review. And then once assets are transferred into the trust and it would be permanently managed, it would be permanently managed by ECF as the trustee. So the institution of ECF would be the trustee. Why is that beneficial to you? It's beneficial because, because of the changes in uh, trust and estates laws and other things, there's fewer and fewer uh, trust and estates attorneys that are expert in this. And most attorneys are very grateful to receive a nearly perfected trust document. And so this is an advantage to them as well as they don't have to serve as trustee. ECF as an institution serves as trustee, okay? So, and these can be more complex. I don't wanna get into greater uh, detail other than saying these can either be paid out as a variable amount based upon what their value is year to year, which will shift, or a fixed amount, okay? So it can be done in either way. Very briefly, and then we'll um, be taking some questions in a moment. Charitable gift annuity, quick illustration. As you can see, this is for Miss Smith. And I must say, it is often um, women who make significant planned gifts. Uh, if, and generally, women are more charitable than men anyway. If you don't believe me, simply read the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. Nonetheless, in this case, Miss Smith at 75, um, made a $100,000 cash gift for a charitable gift annuity because at her age of 75, she would receive a 5.4 annuity rate. She would receive guaranteed to her for the rest of her life, $5,400. Now, most of the time, vast majority of the time, when Miss Smith passes away, about 50% though it can be higher or it can be lower depending on markets and exactly how long Miss Smith lives, about 50% of the original gift would be left for charity. Um, it works the same way 
when you have two people, when you have a married couple or a couple, whatever that case might be, um, in this case, uh, their annuity rate would be lower because you're talking about two lives, not just one. And their annuity rate would be lower right around uh, $4,600, as you can see here. And again, the charity would receive about 50%. Again, not guaranteed, can be higher, can be lower, but the income to the people receiving income is guaranteed, but generally about 50% is left for the congregation or other charities. I'm gonna take some questions in just a second, but I wanted to uh, wrap up with a few other ideas. Again, these are just simply ideas for you to consider. I'm not encouraging you to do any of them, but it's important for you to know what's possible because in all of these ways, you can uh, make a gift to your congregation. So I mentioned before retirement, uh, retirement accounts, those tax deferred retirement accounts. Um, people my age, I just turned 54 on Thursday. People my age and younger have heard of these things called pensions. Bob, have you heard of a pension? It, in English, it's a pension. While people my age and younger never got to get any pensions. All we have are these uh, wonderful retirement accounts that we're able to put money away while we're working into a tax deferred account. And then we pay taxes when we take withdrawals as everybody probably knows. I talked earlier about the IRA, but what I wanna mention again here is that all of the different tax deferred accounts, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, et cetera, all of those where uh, they're tax deferred and you only pay taxes when you take a withdrawal, if you leave, if you leave the ultimate balance of that to a charity like St. Mary's, St. Mary's receives that full gift without paying any of the deferred taxes. This is going to be a major opportunity for people to make these really significant planned gifts in the future by leaving remainders after someone and their spouse has passed. Um, the other opportunities to think about would be life insurance. This can be a little more complex for term life insurance um, or many of the other different policies that exist. You can make your parish the ultimate beneficiary of a policy and it would just receive it directly. If you're thinking of doing that, be sure to give the beneficiary designation form to the parish. And that's because when someone passes away, the beneficiary has to seek uh, the insurance proceeds. There's no requirement, sadly, no requirement for the life insurance company to seek out the beneficiaries. There are other options with life insurance, and I'm happy to share those resources with the leaders of your parish, where if you have a cash value policy that you no longer need, let's say you took it out uh, to benefit your children if you were to pass away suddenly, and now your children make much, much more money than you ever did, and they don't need it at all, well, uh, it is possible to change the beneficiary and make the parish the owner and beneficiary of those policies. And if you're still paying uh, for that policy, you can actually make donations to the parish and receive a charitable deduction for those. Um, so that's a really interesting opportunity. If you wanna learn more about it, I'm happy to chat. The, uh, the last uh, thing on this slide is real estate mentioned it before, be sure if you're considering making a gift of real estate out of your estate directly, speak to the leaders, make sure they can receive it. I also um, could talk briefly about it's mentioned in the cheat sheet about a life estate. That is something where someone would actually turn over the property to a charity during their lifetime so that um, they would be able to receive a significant tax deduction for it, but they would retain, they would retain the right to live in it or receive income from it either for a number of years or for the rest of their life. There's a danger in that. And you should again, speak with the leadership of your parish, whether or not this would work, because you want to make sure you leave the best gift possible for your congregation. And I have a house in New Jersey and I tell you in my fifties, it's hard to keep up with everything. And the older you get, the harder it is. You don't want to leave a dilapidated property that's going to cost more to get rid of um, than the parish will receive in the gift. So that's just something to be thinking about.
The last quick note is a very complex gift. This is only for the very wealthiest Americans called a charitable lead trust without getting into all the details. If you're blessed enough to have $10 million or more in assets, this might be a, a tool to use. Um, you may remember that uh, the late Jackie Kennedy had created a charitable lead trust and uh, it, the basic way that these work is you transfer assets into a trust for a certain number of years. And during those years, it pays out to charity during those years that have been specified. And at the end of the period, then shifts back either to what, who's known as the grantor, the original person, or to their heirs. So it can be very useful for a variety of very wealthy individuals, but not for everyone. But I do like to mention it because I never know who I'm talking to. So um, I'd love to take some additional questions and uh, open it up to the floor of St. Mary's again first, while Bob and Brent, you know, pencil in what their difficult question for Jim will be. St. Mary's. And we're here. Hey, Wonderful. Jim. Any questions? Any questions for Jim? <laughs> Either did a good job or a bad job. Bob, That's Bob Pearson. Thing. Bob Pearson. Okay. Always Hi, Bob. What's up? I do have uh, one comment, and that was just on the uh, on the charitable annuity. Yes. And, uh, it. It just seems like the remainder that goes to the, say, to St. Mary's being less than 50%, is that based on the fact that it, it pays out 5% now and interest rates are around 1%? And if interest well, it, rates go a, up, will it do better? Well, it's a combination of reasons. So, it is, so charitable gift annuities are... Um, highly regulated by the states. And so uh, ECF takes care of all the state registration, the requirements of reserves, and the specifications for investing in this way. And they are invested in the market in a variety of uh, securities with the goal of leaving approximately 50%. So it is seeking to appreciate in value over time, but it's done within the context of you're paying out a much higher rate. So it isn't just about interest rates, it's about um, the total return of the portfolio seeking to end up with approximately 50% at the date that the IRS and other government agencies have estimated that a person would pass away. And, uh, 50% is its nature. There are some charities and it's wrong. Uh, I always talk about 50%. There are some charities that act as if a charitable gift annuity will leave 100%. And that almost never happens. And uh, so it's just important to know that it's normally around 50%, but it could be lower, could be higher, all depending on the performance of the market and more so on how long someone lives. If someone lives far beyond their life expectancy, the amount will be lower than 50%. It could even go to zero, but the income to the individual would be maintained then by the assets of the Episcopal Church Foundation, which, which has a $45 million endowment. Any other questions from St. Mary's? Bob, do you have a question? I see you took yourself off mute. Yes, I do. Please proceed. The, uh, the question that comes up is uh, with the ECF um, annuity, for example. Right. Can that be less than 50% on the initial uh, approach to that? Or is that kind of a base that's uh, regulated or required by the charity? Um, let me go back to the example. Mm -hmm. So um, you're giving a gift of 100000 right? Correct. And let's say that you want to give 10% of that at the end 
which would be uh, ten thousand dollars. Is that something that? Uh, oh, I see. You mean specifying a dollar amount to be given correct. as so? Unfortunately, you must uh, specify percentages. We require that you must give out percentages. So, for example, let's say that it worked out for Miss Smith that she died at exactly the date that uh, the that the IRS assigned for her. Um, and the American Council of Gift Annuity also participated in that calculation. But anyway, so 50,000 is left over, right? So mm -hmm. of that 50,000, it would then break down to the percentages originally allocated. As you'll see in uh, the slide before, as well as your cheat sheet, 10% or $5,000 out of that 50,000 would come back to the Episcopal Church Foundation to help support the ongoing plan giving efforts of the Episcopal Church. And the remainder, the 45,000, would then be paid out in its uh, derivation of the percentages. So you can't say 10,000, then 2x charity. It would have to be a percentage payout. Does okay. that make sense? Well, the, well, the follow up question to that is uh, no problem with the percentage of the remainder. Uh, does that have to be a charitable contribution for all of those, or can it be individuals? It must be charitable. Okay. It must be Thank charitable. You. Its nature is that these only can go to charities. Right. That's why you got the tax deduction at the beginning, because ultimately everything goes to charity. Right. Okay, great. So um, are there any other questions at St. Mary's? That's the... So the question is, um, so, you, so if you purchase one for $100,000 up front, how much, how much of that is tax deductible? So it depends on a variety of factors, and we would have to run an illustration to give you exactly what that would be. Um, I don't want to get into all the technical part of this, but there are a variety of rates that are assigned for internal rates of return. So... Um, depending on a number of factors, the tax deduction for that gift of $100,000 is going to be less than 50,000. Um, recently, we ran one and it was under 30,000 given their age. So that's, it's a variety of factors, but we would need to actually run an illustration to calculate that. But I have an offer for you. And that offer is what you see on the screen right now, which is the we at ECF sponsor a donor website, which your parish is welcome to put on its website as well. Um, as you can see, it's not telling you to give your gift to the Episcopal Church Foundation. It's to give your gift to your favorite uh, Episcopal charity or parish. Uh, on this website, episcopalgifts.org, you have the ability to run your own gift illustration. So anytime, day or night, you're having trouble sleeping, you could either listen to my webinar, which might well put you back to sleep, or you can go online to episcopalgifts.org, use the plan giving calculator and run as many illustrations as you desire to see how it would play out for you in your particular circumstances. To get a, a, the most complete um, illustration, though, you can contact me or one of my staff at ECF, and we can run that for you just to give you those exact numbers. But its nature for that charitable deduction has to do with uh, the expectation of what the remainder would be in uh, current dollars. So that's, I mean, without getting into every uh, mathematical detail about it. So obviously you'd get a larger tax deduction with a pooled income fund because that expectation would be nearly the same amount uh, that you had given, but of course it's in current dollars, so it would be discounted. If you create a donor advised fund, that's uh, where you would get the full deduction in the year that you make it because there's no income involved. It's literally a, ch a completed charitable deduction. Any other questions, concerns? What I wanted to end on is, uh, first of all, to thank you all for your time and your attention, but also we've been talking a lot of technical detail. And that's important because you want to know 
what type of gift might be right for you. However, and as you'll read in the various donor stories on our donor website at physicalgifts.org, as well as in all of our materials, regardless of what choice you make, which gift you think is best for you and your family, and perhaps no gift is best. It all depends on your context. But when you do make that commitment, it is so crucially important um, to, to have the leadership of the parish recognize, and that's what I will continue to work with them on, about how important that gift is to you, because it is truly a gift to another member of your family, your parish family, and your intention is to see that its work and ministry lasts into the future. And on behalf of St. Mary's, for all of you who have already made this commitment or are considering making it in the future, um, on their behalf, I thank you for that consideration because it will enable the parish to do that ministry long into the future. And you guys have a wonderful parish. <laughs> I've been uh, learning so much about you. Now at ECF, vp.org, as you see at the bottom of your screen, I have a ton of webinars. All, uh, unfortunately, you have to look at my face most of the time for all the planned giving webinars, as well as a variety of others um, similar to this. And there'll be more webinars to come. Uh, we've recently been recording some webinars in Espanol. Uh, my Spanish is not fantastic, but I did participate in one uh, just two weeks ago. So uh, please know that all of us at the Episcopal Church Foundation are uh, anxious to help you in any way that we can and help you to consider what is the best gift for you and to help you um, make that decision. So thank you all for your time. I want to turn the floor back to um, my pals who are there, Tim and Tom. Do either of 